Hello and welcome to Curzon Living Room, an ongoing session of live Q&A events on Curzon Home Cinema. My name is Amon Woman and I am a contributing editor to Empire Magazine. Today I'm in conversation about Miss Juneteenth with director Channing Godfrey Peoples. If you're watching us live, we're taking your questions via comments on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is at Curzon Cinemas. Please use the hashtag Curzon Living Room and we will read out as many as we can. Channing, welcome. Hey, Mom. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. Um, can you talk about the genesis of this story for those who may not know? Yeah, um, you know, for folks who haven't seen it, um, I'll just say a little bit about the story. Um, the story is about a woman named Turquoise, and She's a former beauty queen turned hardworking single mother and she's preparing her rebellious teenage daughter for this Miss Juneteenth pageant and she's hoping to keep her from repeating her same mistakes. Um, the story is set in a city in the US called Fort Worth, Texas, but it's set in a very specific neighborhood of, in that city. Um, it's where I grew up, it's on the south side of Fort Worth and it's a historically black community and um, the pageant that I mentioned, obviously people know the film is called Miss Juneteenth, is a scholastic um, beauty pageant for young black women to gain college scholarship. And um, really quickly, if people haven't heard um, what Juneteenth is, I know it's been in the press quite quite a bit um, lately, unfortunately, because we've been navigating you know, national tragedies in the US, so now Juneteenth is more in the zeitgeist. But um, Juneteenth is a day that commemorates the fact that the enslaved people in Texas didn't find out that they were free until two and a half years after everyone else. That's sadly two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So in um, Texas, we commemorate it every year with just like you, you saw in the trailer, just like parades and there's blues music and barbecue. And in the centerpiece of it is the Miss Juneteenth pageant. Absolutely. I wanted to talk a bit, little bit about uh, the mother-daughter relationship, which really sort of drives this movie. Alexis Jacquesi is fantastic as Kai. Uh, what was that audition process like and how did you know when you'd found the one? Um, I wish that she was here because she would probably <laughs> have a different perspective on it. But um, what's so stunning about Alexis is that um, this is her first feature film. Right. And um, it's interesting because um, on the page, like one of the descriptions of her character right away is it's something like in a, I may be misquoting it. I'm sorry, I may misquote my own script, but <laughs> something like, you know, um, this young woman, Kai, um, who has the, has these eyes that look like they've seen too much too soon, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I needed to find someone who could have that sense of, um, world weariness at a young age, but also, you know, made you want to reach out to her, you know, like there was, you know, give you this sense of like, you wanted to hop on this train, you know, towards her future, like that there was hope, you know, um, for her future. And so when I saw her in her auditions, I went, wow, you know, she had that, you know, she had those, those kind of eyes that made me want to reach out to her and, you know, made me want to see her again and again. So, you know, her audition process, I think, was definitely intense. You know, she read for the role um, and then she ended up reading with the lead actor, Nicole, as well. Um, and they had great chemistry and she just hopped in and we went through, before we started the film, I just sat down with her and went through the entire script with her. And we talked about, you know, my ideas for the script, for her character, tone and pace. And when I tell you, she was so hardworking and so amazing. I can't stand up about her. I'm going to stop now. I'm excited, <laughs> I'm excited to see what she does next. <laughs> Absolutely. Me too. It sounds, it sounds like you're saying that the chemistry between Nicole and Alexis was almost immediate. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that you you don't, I don't think that you know, like how everything is going to come together, in my opinion, till you have, you know, you have all these ingredients that go into the salad when you get on set, you know, <laughs> you made the salad and you've got to mix it up. So like once we got into, you know, they always had a certain amount of chemistry, you know, I saw in the read, you know. And then once we got on set, we shot on location for this film and they were like in the environment, like you really got to see 
um, the specificity of their performances come alive. So it was exciting. Amazing. We have a question from uh, Simone from London. Uh, I loved the movie and thought it looked gorgeous. Can you tell me about how you worked with your cinematographer and what your visual reference points were? Absolutely. What a great question. Um, so my cinematographer was this um, this man named Daniel Patterson, who, you know, I saw his work and I was like, oh my goodness, like his images were so poetic and he had a beauty in the way that he shot black people. And I was like, look, this is my top mandate. You know, I've got a film full of black folks and every, you know, tone you can imagine. Like I have to find someone who can see, um, who can shoot like black folks in this really beautiful way. And um, also kind of had a mandate about color to um, let me just kind of circle back about my approach. Like I really am, um, you know, I'm very specific as a filmmaker and authenticity is the most important thing to me. Also, I mentioned earlier, you know, that I'd grown up in this community. And so, you know, I, I knew this community inside out and like, it inspired much of the story. So when I would, um, I, I could go sit in the bar in which the film would, was made, you know, and it's an actual bar and I could just look around and see people and be inspired by their stories. And there's a color to that environment. Um, it's a color in the way people, they live out loud, you know? And one of the things that people have in common in this community that I grew up in, they have this determination and this grit about them, um, but they also carry themselves with grace as a sense of pomp and circumstance. So you know, that's how I spoke to my cinematographer, you know, I, like I need to have this colorful world, but I need to also feel the grit in the world. Um, there was also a juxtaposition of um, the juke joint world. So juke joint, you know, it, is the bar. That's, <laughs> it feels like an old school juke joint, you know, but now we'd be, we'd be calling it a bar. But anyway, um, so we had the juxtaposition of the turquoise's working world in the bar versus the pageant world, you know, that she'd been in in her past. So the working world feels more handheld, more free flowing, you know, um, and we wanted the pageant world to feel more traditional, um, more ordered, if you will. Um, so th those are the way we were communicating, but I also had visual references. I know um, that question was asked, like I loved um, Gordon Park's segregation series, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, and those were, that was, a big visual reference for me, but I also pull references from everywhere, from um, from photography, from art. You know, I could see someone walking down the street, you know, and it would inspire me. Um, see, see someone in the environment. So, um, it, it, you know, visual references really can come from everywhere. But I really depended on the community to inform the visuals. Absolutely, and you mentioned authenticity there, which is a word that I've seen used a lot when discussing this film. Um, and I think much of that is because you grew up in Fort Worth, Texas yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm betting there have been a few details in other films about Southern life but that I've had you frustrated because you know better. So now that you've gotten to make a film about Southern black life, what is your favorite little detail that you included in this movie? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many details. Um, I know probably what one of my favorite scenes are, but you're asking me detail. Um, everybody brings up the salting the beer um, yeah. <laughs> detail, which is another detail, you know, that I experienced being in the bar itself, like in research. Um, I got to like work in the bar for a couple of nights to just kind of get to know Turquoise's journey. And it's a place that I frequented, it's owned by family friends. So, you know, you would see like little details like that all the time. Um, and so that that's one of them. Um, the horses also are a very real thing in, in the community. <laughs> so I knew that they had to be included. So there's just lots of things, you know, I think all these little details just inherently came out because, you know, I'm writing it from this particular perspective, you know, and let me just say really quickly, the community itself, like the locations are like, they're so lived in, like, cause I mentioned they're real locations. They're like owned by family, friends, like the bar and like the funeral home. And these are like um, businesses that are generations old. They're like legacy businesses. They keep getting passed down through generations. And so, you know, I wanted the movie to feel like that, you know, and these places are being gentrified too. So people are just like, these are ours, you know? Um, 
I wanted the movie to feel like that. I wanted to have this lived in quality and it almost feels like, you know, because these, these spaces are being gentrified, everything feels slightly past its expiration date. <laughs> so that's how I communicated with my collabor collaborators. I, I was like, there's a beauty to everything. You know, there's a fullness, there's color and, you know, the living in this community, but everything needs to feel like it's slightly past its expiration date. I need to feel that in the cinematography, um, the costume design, the production design, you name it. So that was a big one. Good stuff. Another word I see uh, used a lot when it comes to this film is timely. Um, and I wanted to ask, is there something to that or should we just retire that word entirely because this film would have been timely five, 10, 20 years from now? I love the way that you put that and I probably will take that with me. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, like when people would ask me that, you know, I was just like, these are the conversations that we've been having in the black community as long as I can remember, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that my mother was having and her mother before that, you know, and hopefully we can retire some of these conversations once my, you know, two-year-old daughter gets of age, but you know, who knows, like um, 2020 has shown us quite a few things. Yeah, it has. <laughs> uh, we have another question there from Jen from Peckham. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where your career goes next. Do you have more movies set in Fort, in Fort Worth in mind or will you look elsewhere for inspiration? Yeah, um, I definitely have more movies set in Fort Worth and both. I'll be looking elsewhere for inspiration <laughs> as well. Yeah. You know, I've lived most of my life in Fort Worth, but not all of it, you know. And um, a mandate for me was always, I wanted to, you know, tell stories that centered Black women in their journeys because I they were the kind of stories that I yearned for that I found in literature, but it was hard to find in cinema. Um, I also wanted to tell stories, very human stories, you know and stories that um, that show the specificity of worlds we often haven't seen. So wherever that takes me, I, I am working on another original, which I can't talk much about, but it has those <laughs> mandates, you know? But thank awesome. you, thank you so much for the question. You can tell me all about it off camera when we're done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the use of quiet in this movie. There's so many really great moments um, uh, what the moments of quietude just really so effective to me in this movie. Were those built into the screenplay or was it just because you knew, well, actually was, was it built into the screenplay because you know Nicole can do so much with a look or was that sort of discussions that you had once you on set? Yeah, I think for me as a filmmaker, it's important to be able to work with um, actors that can just be in quiet moments, you know, and can, can sit in quiet moments. And so that's always what I'm looking for in casting, you know, and um, I feel fortunate to have worked with actors who can do that and, you know, to know that there are actors out there in this space, because, you know, those are the kind of folks that I want to work with. Um, I think this, the script itself, you know, um, it was very, very specific in the, the the dialogue and the structure. It was just like a domino effect. If we lost dialogue here, you know, it may have a domino effect down the road and we may right. lose the intention. Um, so I was very specific to like, you know, shooting the dialogue that was on the page, but I'm also the kind of director who wants the dialogue, you know, the actors have gone through the dialogue in the scene, it'll be a little while before I yell cut. <laughs> Just because I'm looking for those little human moments, you know. Um, also, I think, um, you know, Nicole as, as an actor, you know, she's someone whose work I've been familiar with for a while. Like, I knew that I was definitely making this, um, you know, a lot of the film was about um, this, her internal life as well. So I did need an actor who could, you know, you could see, you know, you could just watch her thinking sometimes. <laughs> I also will say that, um, and she's definitely an actor who can bring that as we, you know, we've seen in her body of work and we see, have seen in the film. Also, I'm super inspired by, uh, I think filmmakers who have more subtle quiet films. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Charles Burnett, I don't know, you know, if everyone, if people out there are familiar with their, his, his work, you should be if you're not. But yeah. just like Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep um, was especially inspirational. I mean, he has another film that I really love, My Brother's Wedding. I love Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. Um, 
you know, so, and there, there's so many other filmmakers that I could talk about, but that I love, but they have that really like subtle, quiet style. And then I also mentioned earlier that I'm really inspired by literature. So I really grow, grew up reading like literary greats, like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker, you know, mm -hmm. um, Sonia Sanchez, who's a poet, you know, so I, I have a very, like, I think there's some, there's some uh, literature in my style, you know, there's some poetry in my style, it could be very lyrical. Um, so, cause I think I had those influences, just influences, it all just kind of came together. I see, absolutely. Um, Miss Juneteenth is about a black woman who had her dreams that were revouted. This is your directorial debut. From what I know about directing, it involves a lot of problem solving. So what's yeah. something that didn't go originally to plan for you that you had to figure out a way around? Um, I can't think of anything specifically. Um, I'm jogging my brain, but I will tell you, I had a unique circumstance and it, it, it was, it was a challenge, but it was also a joy. Like I was a new mom <laughs> when I was shooting this dream team. So there'll be plenty of times where my uh, sweet little baby daughter would be in the little baby carrier, you know? <laughs> and she would be on set with me. So I had to navigate my debut film in a different kind of way, but it was also, um, you know, I keep using the term poetic. It was poetic in a sense, because I'm, you know, created this story about this mother and daughter and I think my daughter, you know, having my daughter definitely informed, um, you know, whereas I had a really, I had a more tough love version of Turquoise, the lead character on paper. Um, my daughter informed the joy. And like, after having my daughter, I was like, wow, you know, I had this bond with this little human being and I just felt this joy I can't even describe. And so I kept jumping in and the directing and be like, okay, you know, we've got this tough love version, but no matter what, we have to find the joy as well. Yeah, no, that definitely comes through. It's one of my favorite things about that relationship because I have seen that sort of dynamic before. I can it can easily just get dark, and you know that that, that relationship can fragment and fracture. But they're still, uh, even when they're at odds with each other, they're you know the tenderness, the kindness, the love is there, and that really comes through. Well, you have I, I have to um, you know thank my baby daughter for that when she gets old enough to appreciate it <laughs> because, Absolutely. just to be honest you know, I've, heard, I've heard the film described you know now as you know subtle as delicate you know and I know that um, she definitely had an impact on those things yeah we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about Nicole Bahari and how she could do so much with a look I want to talk about what is now the poster of the movie where it's that scene where she's smoking on the porch with the crown on her head at what point did you know that you wanted that to be your one sheet? Well, you know, I'm working in concert with um, the distributors as well on that. But it's funny because um, I think one of the producers said on set, that's it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then I had a, um, you know, I want to, you know, an incredible director that I know, I had her look at the movie um, early on and she came back to me and said, that's your poster, you know? <laughs> and then, um, you know, the distributors, we worked together to, you know, make sure that it was, but yeah, totally like, um, it, it's a very impactful scene. And I was, you know, so happy to see it come together in that way because I, you know, it meant a lot to me in the script. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's an awesome scene. Um, another awesome scene uh, has to do with, uh, uh, turquoise doing Kai's hair. Um, I love sort of seeing scenes like this in Black Stories. Can you speak to the importance of having a scene like that in this movie? Yeah, I mean, it just goes back to um, authenticity. And also, I think it goes back to representation. And, you know, that was my journey, you know, sitting in my mama's knee, <laughs> having my hair done. It's become my daughter's journey already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think that, you know, in making such a personal film, it was just important to have these, you know, authentic stories, you know, in my journey, especially in many of the, you know, Black women I know, and, you know, that's their story as well. I just wanted to see it brought to screen. There's been a discussion in the industry lately about how uh, there are no sort of hairdressers who have worked on Black hair on sets where there's Black creatives on set. I imagine that wasn't an issue on this film. No. <laughs> <laughs> you 
<laughs> oh, we definitely, you know, we had every hair texture you can imagine, you know, and I wanted to celebrate that because, you know, um, there's the, you know, metaphor of our hair as our crown, you know, that I want to be able to embrace. Um, Austin, I also happen to think like, we're beautiful in every way you can imagine and every hairstyle you can imagine no matter whether it's natural hair or wig or whatever you want you choose to do with your hair you know there's beauty in the way we embrace it and so i wanted to see that on screen absolutely um in the u.s you released miss Juneteenth on the anniversary of the day and i remember uh the time around the release online uh going on twitter and seeing many people sort of familiarizing themselves with miss Juneteenth they didn't know what it was. Did that surprise you at the time? It did and it didn't because, <laughs> I mean, part of the reason that I wanted to make the movie was because, um, you know, it, I had, when I left Texas and went off to graduate school in California, you know, I would say to people every June 19th, happy Juneteenth, you know, <laughs> and they would just kind of look at me curiously. And, you know, that surprised me early on because, I was like, wow, you know, people just really don't have an understanding of what it, what it is because it had been such a big part of the fabric of my life. Like, you know, you look forward to going to Juneteenth every year. And as a kid, you know, it's more about the pomp and circumstance. It's about the parades and the music and the dance, you know, and getting mm -hmm. to see folks in the community you hadn't seen for a little while. And um, as, I, as I got to be an adult, you know, the meaning, obviously I began to appreciate the meaning in a different way, you know, that it was about the commemoration of our enslaved ancestors, you know, whose freedom was intentionally kept from them. So um, yes and no, I guess it was a surprise for me to see that people didn't know, but I was already aware that it wasn't well known. I, even in pitching the film, you know, we'd have to go out and explain what Juneteenth was before we ever got to the story, you know, so I knew. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I, th I think it just speaks to the importance of these sorts of films as education. Because um, I think of not just Miss Juneteenth, I think of what happened with Watchmen and what that show introduced people to. And then there's this upcoming film Steve McQueen's directed, directing called um, uh, Mangrove uh, and yeah. what that is introducing people to. And it's just, you know, it's amazing that, you know, <laughs> these, these are the films which are putting certain things in the zeitgeist when they really should have been you know, taught at schools. Yeah, I mean, it is amazing. And, you know, it's it, it saddens me, but I'm glad to see people gain more awareness. And I will say that, you know, a big part of, and you're right, like education is important. And, and um, I grew up with that education about what Juneteenth was, because like I'm thinking about, there's a woman in the community in which you see, um, if people have seen the film or if they're gonna see the film, there's a woman that says, you know, I'm, I'm, my name is Opal Lee and welcome to um, the Juneteenth pageant. Yeah. And um, she's this woman who's like 90 plus years young that has kept Juneteenth alive in my community. You know, I mean, I, I and she's the reason I remember growing up with it. And, you know, when I said that I was gonna make a film that was called Miss Juneteenth, you know, she was like one of the first folks I went to and said, you know, and had questions and opened the door and, you know, and research put me to, you know, she said, you can come in here and research me and my creative partner, um, who also happens to be my husband, by the way, I should mention that. <laughs> awesome. But um, we researched the film together and developed the film together and um, went to Opalie and said, hey, you know, we're doing this. And she said, okay, that's fine. You know, I'll answer any of the questions, but then she put us to work too. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we had a very, a very inside out research process, which was very helpful for the film. Amazing. Um, one of the things about this film is that it's generational. Um, you know, Turquoise uh, thinks black beauty means one thing because of her, her area, her area, like the, the Toni Morrison poem comes into that. Uh, Kai thinks it's another, and I think the advent of social media has probably helped shape that. How do you see it changing in another couple of decades or so? You mean um, the way we perceive black beauty? Yeah. I mean, I, well, you know, I see, it, it, there's been obviously there's always like this ebb and flow right but I see you know people being more accepting you know and I hope that that trend continues and that's why I want to be able to like that's why I say representation is so important and I want to be able to make films um and where oops I'm sorry about that 
we're live i'm sorry I don't know the computer. but um <laughs> i want to be able to create films in which we're represented you know and all our beauty but i definitely the funny thing i one of the ways that I, one story i could tell that relates a bit is when we were um you know i, I knew that i wanted turquoise and kai both to have natural hair um and when the young women we were casting for the pageant contestants, you know, we started casting and there's a mix of, you know, young women that have been involved in the Miss Juneteenth pageant. Um, the young woman that you see as the current Miss Juneteenth was actually the current Miss Juneteenth. But there's also, you know, a mix of young women that are actors. And um, when they, when we got them all together, like they all showed up with like all this beautiful natural hair, you know, mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> that's, where they were, you know, and um, I was like, that's just, that's so stunning to me, you know, it's it's beautiful that that women are accepting themselves in all these different forms, you know, whether their hair is, you know, natural or whether, you know, they choose to wear wigs or whatever it is, you know, I just think that it's about acceptance and I, I, I hope that it's changing, you know, I'm optimistic, but I hope it is, especially for my daughter. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned representation there, and obviously the Black Lives Matter movement, it pertains to a lot more than just George Floyd. It's about um, businesses um, as well, and you know, Hollywood is one such business. Do you feel a shift uh, with, with all these conversations that have been happening in that particular industry? You, you mean as far as like um, us, like as far as gentrification, or are you talking about in like the film industry? No. In, in the film industry? Yeah, I mean, I'm always like cautiously optimistic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Um, that, that's just something that remains to be seen. You know, people have come out and made statements and things like that. And, you know, um, I know that we're in a moment in which, you know, people are more open to hearing Black voices. And I don't just mean, you know, in the film industry, I mean, on the ground, just like the activists and mm. the people who are really doing the work, you know, um, I just hope that that, that that continues really, you know, that's why I said I'm cautiously optimistic, <laughs> but like I said, I have hope and they'll, and I'll keep, you know, telling stories and hope that, you know, me being able to like tell them to get a movie like Miss Juneteenth out into the world will open doors for other stories to be told as well. Amazing. Absolutely. Uh, I'm afraid that is all we have time for. I want to thank Vertigo. No way. I know already. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank Vertigo for making tonight's event possible. And most of all, to thank our guest tonight, Channing Godfrey Peoples. Um, Miss June Pink is available now to stream on Curzon Home Cinema. If you enjoyed the film and this event, please tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies, go and watch this movie because it is great. Uh, upcoming events on Curzon Home Cinema include Craig Roberts and Sally Hawkins talking about their new collaboration, Eternal Beauty, with writer Ian Hayden-Smith. That is on Monday, the 5th of October. And then on Tuesday, the 20th of October, we have a Q&A with director Fred Scott about his documentary, Being a Human Person. You can follow Curzon Cinemas on Twitter and Facebook for all the latest updates. I've been your host tonight, Amon Warman. You can find me on Twitter at A Warman. Thank you and good night. Thank you.